Hi, welcome to Construction Business Management. I'm Tom Stevenson, and today we're gonna to be talking about developing a business strategy. We've been discussing business plans in previous modules, and today we're gonna to be talking about developing a strategic plan uh, for the purpose of having a competitive advantage, positioning your business, having a structural method of moving your business in a specific direction that you deem to be that will lead you to success. So what we want to do is understand what a strategy is, understand how we can adjust and pivot based on changes that are taking place in our, our, our marketplace, and how we can apply a business model, a way of monetizing the strategy. What's the point of having a strategy if we can't be profitable at it. So we want to make sure that those pillars that we talked about in the previous video with the business plan, the human resource plan, the financial plan, the operations plan, the marketing plan, that they work together collaboratively in the same direction. So they're not kind of fighting for limited resources and going scattered in different directions. And you're not receiving the benefit of that collaboration. Um, so uh, par part and parcel of that is developing a business strategy. And you know what? Existing businesses, many existing businesses, they kind of get stuck in a rut. You know, they get they meet with a certain amount of success and then it kind of plateaus and they kind of just sort of stay there for a long time, uh, sort of in a holding pattern. Uh, some businesses from that, they may go up, but they also may go down. Typically, it's hard to stay at that same plateau for very long unless you're uh, innovating, unless you're improving, unless you're adjusting and adapting, because even if you're at that same point that made you successful, Others are doing things to take away bits and pieces of your business. And if you're not careful before long, you look around. And like I said in the first uh, module, you're like Kodak and your business is gone. It's evaporated. Uh, so you have to be uh, cognizant of those things. And sometimes the existing businesses have um, that problem. Even businesses that were originally really, really innovative in what they did. I guess a good example might be BlackBerry. And BlackBerry was the most successful with the smartphones when they first started. Uh, but very quickly when Apple came out with its touchscreen and the apps and th those various concepts, was very slow to respond and adapt. And that kind of uh, led to their demise in that market as being the market leader. Um, so these things happen very quickly and it can happen in construction with the way that change is taking place in our business as well. So we want to have a, a strategy that we can also recognize uh, changes in the marketplace, but also opportunities and also know when maybe a strategy is not working and we have to change it. So we'll be looking at um, identifying the company strategy. Um, how we can develop it to provide a competitive advantage, some examples, uh, ways of thinking if you're different uh, businesses in the construction sector, a uh, strategy that can be proactive, uh, reactive, or both based on the external environment, things that are outside that company's control. Um, also thinking a little bit about ethics and how to maintain the integrity of the firm, making sure that we're not doing things we shouldn't be doing and how strategy is tied to the business model, uh, how we monetize the strategy. So those are areas that we'll be discussing. In the previous module, we talked, I at least mentioned uh, that uh, the map is not the territory. So that just means that whatever strategy we come up with, we've got to make sure that um, we've got our pulse on what's actually happening on the ground, feedback so that we can um, take that information and adjust and tweak our strategy so that it becomes a more stronger, resilient um, aspect. Uh, so when we think about strategy, where is the business now? We really have to have a good sense where we are now. Are we starting? Has it been, have we been in business for 10 years? Do we have this opportunity that's been dropped before us? How do we handle it? And where do we want to take the business? What market segments do we want to be in? Well, in the construction sector, it's very difficult to be everything to everybody. So what segments make the best sense? 
uh, if we take the sort of the hedgehog and the fox sort of scenario from Jim Collins' book, um, hedgehog can be the very best in the world at one thing, protecting itself, right? So it can roll up into a ball and the fox, no matter how clever it is, can't figure out how to get at the hedgehog. Uh, the fox can be pretty clever and it can jump around in certain markets and certain changes, uh, but it can't really sort of penetrate the hedgehog's market because it's really got that one down solid. It's the best in that particular marketplace. Uh, so what markets do we want to be in and what's our game plan for that? And really understanding who are our clients. I quickly mentioned it in the last uh, video and I'll mention it again when we get into marketing for sure. But you know, are our clients other businesses? All right, so if we're, if we're a plumbing uh, trade, uh, maybe our clients are customers. Maybe they're not other business, they're customers. So people get their drain plugged or their toilets uh, stopped up and we go in and we unstop it. And maybe they also want their bathroom redone and they call us because they know us and then we actually act like a general contractor in that case and we subcontract to other uh, contractors to redo their bathroom because a big portion of that might be the plumbing side of things. So client based, very individually based. But maybe that same plumbing company has determined, you know what, 60% of our business will be that. The other 40% of our business, we're a subcontractor to general contractors. So when they get bathrooms that they want get want to be done, we will do the plumbing in those bathrooms. And that might be a portion of their business. So they've kind of had a strategy who their clients are. One, we've got uh, direct clients and the other, we've got uh, business to business. So the business to the business side, if I have seven or eight contractors that call me all the time for bathrooms, well, that's a pretty good segment and that's a pretty good overall portion of my business. Other plumbing contractors may decide, I don't wanna deal with contractors, I just wanna deal with clients or vice versa. I don't wanna deal with clients, I just wanna deal with good contractors that I know and trust. Uh, so there, there's these different mixtures that you can sort of develop with a strategy and you might have reasons for why you'd wanna have a mixture of different um, strategies. It might be that you don't want to have all your eggs in that contractor basket or all your eggs in that client basket uh, because it's harder to keep getting new clients that way. Um, so there could be a whole um, wealth of reasons that would help you to select for your business what you think is the best um, model for that. So who your clients are. What are you trying to achieve? You know, what are you, tr overall, what are you trying to achieve by doing this? Good to really come to grips with what you're trying to achieve. And then that's gonna help to lead you, well, how are we going to get there? What are the things we're gonna need to do from where we are right now to get us to where we want to be? And what are the steps, the roadmap that we're gonna take to get us from point A to point B, wherever that might be? Um, and describing that path. That's what the business strategy is. It's really thinking that through and thinking about possible um, pathways. It's like I, I hear people will say, well, it'll, business plan never goes the way that you thought. And you know what, that's true. So whatever strategy you come up with, it's not gonna be pure and simple way of getting there. But what I do know is if you have a strategy, you're more attuned to and you have clarity on your goals, you're more attuned to where you want to go. So you kind of see opportunities all of a sudden where before you didn't really pay attention to them. It's kind of like you want to buy a, um, you know, you want, you want to buy a uh, C-Class Mercedes and it's uh, got XYZ and you're thinking about this C-Class Mercedes. You know what? All of a sudden, everywhere on the road, all you see is these C-Class Mercedes and you're wondering, where did they all come from? How is it everybody's got a C-Class Mercedes? Nobody has a C-Class Mercedes more than they had before you started looking. It's just now you notice them. Nobody knew your strategy. You didn't know your strategy until you developed it. Now you see it and you're going to observe and you're going to pick up opportunities that otherwise would have went right by. It's a very similar concept to that. And your employees that are working with you that are involved in this also will pick up on 
those things that they didn't before notice. Uh, so that's how that really kind of comes into really accelerating the aspect of being able to move your business in a certain direction uh, more forcefully, more with more um, flywheel intention, buildup of energy towards that. So what is strategy? It's the development of a combination of competitive moves that are used by managers to, control, to grow the business. Uh, it's looking at you know, where there's some opportunities and really sort of mapping out a plan for how you can instill those opportunities. Sometimes it requires innovation. Sometimes it requires just a concentrated effort of energies in a specific um, direction competing that allows you to stake out a market position and compete successfully at towards that position. I remember years ago, um, and again, uh, I'm not trying to use the same companies over and over again, but I work with them, so I have some good ideas as to how they, they utilize things. Uh, years ago, there was this aspect of um, building lot layout and traditionally it was kind of like narrow lots and deeper lots uh, for building houses and I remember um, uh, Madame e. Holmes they picked up uh, an idea and I think they picked the idea up from Southern California uh, where the lots were a lot wider and not as deep so it wasn't taking up more area that's for sure it wasn't taking up more area in fact it was probably taking up slightly less um, but the lots weren't as deep, but they were wider and they called it wide lot. And what that meant was that they could have a, uh, they would put the house closer to the front, to the curb. They would get the bylaw approvals than was being done. It was more deep setback. So they put them a little bit closer to the curb and they would be wider and they could have a nice front porch with nice fenestration windows wider because the house was wider because the lot was wider and it really sort of built a much better sense of community because people would sit on their porches and the garages they wouldn't have stick out in in front of the house so if you look at how houses were built uh, in the 1970s 80s and early early 90s uh, we would build these houses and then we'd have the the garage stick out in front of the house. So the front door of the house was kind of set back and the garage would stick out a mile. And it was good for the interior floor space. Uh, it was kind of narrow. There would be very little window on the front of the house. But it, as far as neighborhoods and communities, it was awful because people would, you know, with the electric door, door opener, they'd drive their car in park their car and go in through the, the door to the house and nobody would sit on the porch because it was too narrow and there was no room and you were way back and you were kind of in this corner with the garage beside you. And so the aspect of community fell away and also uh, um, crime would build up too, you know, if there was parks and nobody could see it, what was going on in the parks, that sort of thing. So Wide Lot really would put a park in the middle, have all the houses around the park, facing the park, much more fenestration windows, the garage set much further back. You lose some of the interior space that way, but you could build that up by going wider with the house. Uh, and it really changed the sense of community. And they marketed that, they, they divided their lots that way. And so I think they got a real good competitive advantage in the early 2000s with that right it gave them this edge because it was something that would take time for other builders and developers to they were looking at like whoa how come they're selling out so quickly what are what have they got that we don't have and then they'd have to look at okay we got to get the zoning changed we got to do this we got to do that so it gave them probably a good four or five year quick uh upstart on before the competitors would catch up it's kind of like, you know, in the cell phone business, technology moves even quicker than construction. Construction, you got all these bylaws and changes and design issues. So it's a, you, got, you can develop a little bit longer competitive advantage, although it shortens with everything. Uh, but it, it didn't take long before Samsung and everybody and their, their brother was building smartphones, right? And how that uh, caught up to Apple. So Apple really had to innovate and differentiate their brand so that people are willing to pay more for this 
um, iPhone, right? There's a lot of people like myself uh, that will pay more for an iPhone. They want the Apple product, the Apple brand. They kind of associate it. They're in that ecosystem with it. Construction, that was the wide lot bought a lot of time on that to innovate in those particular areas. And then, of course, they, they know that, that they've got to keep innovating in different areas. And so they keep trying to stay one step ahead of the competition. Um, so you can be leaders or you can be followers. And uh, that can be um, uh, the type of business that you decide. Are you going to be the low cost provider of this product or are you going to be the innovator or brand positioner that's going to differentiate the product like an iPhone to say a Samsung uh, that's why there are differences in the pricing pretty um, substantial differences in the pricing I'm not so sure there's that huge a difference in the products themselves but there is definitely a difference in the pricing due to the association of the brand you can think about you see that everywhere you can think about Harley Davidson um, there's people that have Harley Davidson tattoos on their arms, right? So there's people that they'll tattoo their arm with that brand because they like that brand. I don't see anybody with a tattoo, a Yamaha or, or different motorcycle on their arm, right? There's a difference uh, in how those companies are branding themselves and they've got a specific strategy that plays towards those brands. We'll talk about that more in marketing, but um, definitely... Um, that was an aspect of seeking a competitive vision. It made it easier to sell those lots at higher prices than they would have got if they were laid out differently. Um, you may be thinking now, oh, everything's like that now. Yeah, it is now, but not then. <laughs> Uh, growing the business in some cases uh, fighting to maintain the business that you have you're really looking at that um, achieve the targeted goals have measurable goals we've talked about that in previous uh, aspects and then really how do we attract and delight our clients right well you build that community aspect as my previous example I make it safe um, defining a firm strategy answering the how how do we please customers so what are the things that we can do to please customers? How to respond to changing market conditions? How to outcompete rivals? So there's a lot of hows we're trying to define in our strategy. How to grow the business. And you got to know what type of business and then who your clients are to be able to start thinking about how you're going to grow it. If you don't yet know who your clients are or are going to be, then it's hard to figure out how you want to grow it. How to manage each functional piece of the business so that it works to their maximum collectively. And it's not all these individual silos that you see often in larger businesses that then they have trouble communicating across the silos. And that also becomes part of their, their success, becomes part of their downfall because they get so structured and bureaucratic in things that they're not able to respond and be nimble the way smaller companies are. How to achieve strategic and financial uh, objectives. So each one of these requires a lot of creative thought in um, the business development. And whether it's an existing business uh, and or a new business, you really have to think about um, these aspects in those areas. Whether you're a plumbing business or whether you're a... Um, a general contractor or you're a builder or a developer you have to think about those things how to please customers you know who are my customers business to business my customers are uh, financial uh, or um, facilities management managers at um, large facilities maybe it's hospitals maybe it is uh, college building schools etc well I better be thinking how I'm gonna um, please those customers right the facility managers well facility managers are generally pleased when you don't make their life difficult so what are the things that you can do to not make their lives difficult hmm. we make a commitment to finish this school during july and august and be out by middle of august that just made that facilities manager's life not so difficult because if you take longer then their boss is wondering why did it take longer are they not doing their job uh, what are the things that you can do? Make sure that any any uh, of the public that comes into the school, especially children, are kept safe. Make sure that you're not doing any unnecessary disruptions that weren't communicated effectively through the facilities manager. 
um, work close relationship with them to ensure that you understand what their needs are, how to please those customers. Sometimes we don't think like that in construction. We think we got this to do, let's get in, let's get out. And you've got a crew there that's cursing and swearing. All of a sudden that there's complaints and all of a sudden your business is no longer getting business from that client. So developing a strategy that puts you in a proactive place in those areas. That's what you want to be thinking about as a business. And I can tell you a lot of construction, I can tell you a lot of construction businesses don't do this. I'm walking the streets, I'm checking out construction sites all the time, I'm dealing with clients. And I know from myself, when I ran a construction business, how effective or ineffective we were when we did certain things. And so I'm telling you now, you want to look at how you actually please your customers. Strategy development can involve any number of actions, including the ones below. So you can think about uh, actions to grow and diversify the business by entering new businesses. In construction, that's a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, maybe you're an existing business uh, and I think I've got it coming up in a slide and you're currently in the ICI sector, institutional commercial industrial, but you maybe feel that that's a little bit too volatile for you, uh, that there's um, too much uncertainty, and we can get into VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, uh, really looking at those elements of um, that particular business that you're in. So maybe you think that you can offset some of that by getting into the civil side. Uh, so doing some civil uh, infrastructure type projects where that might be less um, highs and lows because uh, there's always government investment into infrastructure whenever there's a recession. So that could help to offset the sort of business cycles. And maybe that's a decision that you want to make. So actions to grow and diversify the business. Uh, I think about um, Jeff Smith had this really good story. He's the CEO of Elliston and years ago he he mentioned it and it was um, the cannonball story. I can't remember if I said this in an earlier lecture, but anyways, it's worth repeating. So the cannonball um, story was that he was building a custom home for himself and uh, you know his background's not detailed construction, it's it's law. Uh, so they were at this home show, him and his wife, and they were kind of looking at um, things. And his wife was all into some of the different booths and the different products. And there was this geothermal system there. And um, she said, so what if it leaks? And uh, the person in the booth said, it won't leak. And she said, well, what if it does? We'll fix it. What if you're not around? Meaning if you went bankrupt because all your products leak. And uh, he said, well, our company's been around for 300 years. Now Jeff's, you know, eyes light up. He's interested in how does a company manage to survive 300 years? And he goes over and starts asking questions. And of course, um, one of the responses uh, is, well, you weren't making geothermal systems 300 years ago. What were you making? And it was cannonballs for the Spanish Armada. Uh, so companies can diverse. They can change their the, um, business models. Uh, they may not want to be overly in just one sector in construction if it's very cyclical and you get caught with it right that can be leave you pretty vulnerable to a down cycle so you if you want to be a resilient business you want to have some contingencies as we mentioned in the last video that can allow you a way to reshift or refocus your business should things happen so like actions to respond to changing market conditions such as a recession so you can see the interconnectedness here actions to defend against aggressive competition. Well, that would be things like uh, BlackBerry and what happened with um, Apple, right? They didn't really have those actions that were strong enough to really defend against some aggressive competition and innovation in that particular area. Um, but you may have to do some strategic actions. You know, there's another industry, you've been in this sector and another industry is coming in the sector and they're going after the school board to take away a portion of your business. You have to look at, well, what can we do? Actions to enter a new geographical area. If we want to enter in this area, this sector, what area, why do we want to enter it? Do we buy an existing company? Do we start from scratch with it and try to keep the culture the way we've got our current culture? Uh, what are some of the unique qualities of this geographical area? Construction, I know the 
uh, of the brightest and best. And sometimes when they go into a geographical area to do a project, they get quite shocked because there's a local marketplace and the trades kind of keep with themselves and they don't want to work with somebody outside their geographical market and there can be resistance with some suppliers so um, what are the actions you need to take to be successful in entering a new geographical area and it happens with construction all the time you might have a client that wants you to all of a sudden do all their stores nationally and you've only been doing them in your current geographical uh, location. So you got to figure out how you're going to work in those particular markets. Actions to strengthen weak areas within the business. Well, how will we go about strengthening the weak areas of the business? How will we get feedback about that and what can we do? Um, actions to form strategic partnerships. There may be some really good opportunities to form partnerships uh, with other firms, other suppliers, uh, other distributors. Um, so you could be the only certified installer of a particular system in a geographical area um, by having a strategic partnership. Um, merger and acquisition opportunities kind of ties with what I was saying. If you're growing into another market, do we just uh, grow organically or do we purchase or acquire somebody in that market? Um, actions to improve our product and service. Well, continuous improvement should be part of your thinking um, to begin with. It might be that, you know, we've done things traditionally and uh, we think that uh, the way the marketplace is changing so rapidly, we should look at changing to a more advanced um, methodology and we're going to institute uh, lean construction methodologies and last planner system. That would be an action that you've decided as a business to improve your product and service in your marketplace. So some, I've got a list here. I don't know if I'll do every one of them. I think some of them I've kind of, kind of done. Um, you, in uh, our marketplace, this happened probably about 10 or 15 years ago. You know, in our marketplace in the greater Toronto area, and I suspect in every big urban center, whether you're talking about Toronto, Toronto and Vancouver in Canada, uh, in New York, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Houston, big urban centers uh, where you probably, there's probably builders and developers that were just in low rise. And at a certain point, they see that there's more units being sold in mid and high rise construction. They start thinking, well, should we expand into that marketplace? Because it seems like all these other um, builders are doing that. We should perhaps do that. So um, you, we've seen a number of um, builder developers do this over the last 10, 15 years in the greater Toronto areas where they only built low rise prior to that wood frame construction. It's a different kind of construction, right? It's uh, reinforced concrete, uh, but they've either purchased existing um, condo builders or apartment builders and um, use that as part of their business, created a separate division, uh, or they started it organically themselves. Um, so that, that can be um, useful. In the case of a recession occurring, a builder might offer discounts, uh, purchasing packages, different, different ways of packaging their material. Um, you may want to, uh, looking at intern, intern, number five, internal client surveys may bring weaknesses to the forefront. You definitely want to have client feedback so every every large company that i've worked with they have all kinds of mechanisms to survey their clients and their customers to really get feedback uh, that's unbiased feedback that helps them to look at huh we got a train here a, a trend here that's going on we better address this and then they that can help give feedback where you decide okay so our clients have had trouble really understanding how we do our scheduling etc Maybe this is the right time to uh, do an internal scheduling program, or maybe this is the right time to institute, like I said before, uh, LPS, last planner system of lean in our corporate structure and how we manage our projects. And maybe this is a good opportunity to also do X, Y, Z. If you don't know where you're weak, you don't know where the best opportunities are to improve. You're just guessing. So you want to really want to get some really good data on that. And that's one way to do it. Uh, strategic alliances, like I mentioned earlier, solar panel, uh, well, I didn't mention this one, solar panel installation company may wish to form a strategic alliance with a solar panel manufacturer. Um, so that might give you some good opportunities, maybe give you some good discounts on a particular panel, and then you're installing 
um, their system and you're marketing with them and you're sort of the approved uh, installer in this geographical location that happens uh, and so and I already mentioned the ones I haven't mentioned I think is because I've already mentioned them so pushing and achieving a competitive advantage it provo really you're looking at you know the more sustainable it is, the longer it is, the better. Uh, something that can be copied and imitated really quickly. Um, don't expect it to give you a very long lasting competitive advantage, but something that takes a little bit more time and effort uh, can uh, be uh, provide some rich rewards in that uh, particular um, area. All right. And that can help you obviously to sort of really compound your, your profitability in those areas. And um, really, it's a series of moves. It's not just one thing. And it really has to be delivered from senior management right through the organization. If senior management doesn't go do a really good job of explaining the why and the how, uh, then the buy-in isn't so much from the lower levels within the business. And then it doesn't have the same kind of oomph that you wanted it to have. And maybe some other competitor that does it better actually wins in that marketplace. So it's the difference between how it is actually developed, but how it's executed. Execution is huge um, in strategic planning. And sometimes it's a matter of not even having the strategic plan perfect before you're piloting it, before you're doing what we call first run studies to see how this works and getting feedback on this so that then you can tweak it and improve it. You know what, the software industry has done this for decades really well. We're only uh, in more recent times starting to understand it a little bit better in the construction sector. Uh, part of that is because when we make a mistake, it's very expensive to make mistakes, but that doesn't still mean that we have to have everything figured out perfectly before we start. We might wanna run some pilots, smaller, projects, smaller trials to see how they work and get feedback from that to um, inst institute in the further rollout of uh, the strategy. So we want to strive, you know, these are some approaches, right? They're not the approaches. These are just some examples. Strive to be the industry's low cost provider. I mentioned, you know, competitive bidding. That's easy to identify in construction. If that's how you are winning all your projects, then that's what you're striving to be is the industry's low cost provider. Um, uh, so lump sum bidding, um, always competitive kind of pricing on that. Uh, that will do that. And that depends on the client types like government organizations that are leaning towards lump sum pricing in those sectors. Uh, other sectors, maybe the commercial, it's not about the low price. It's about the value you provide. And so then you really become their first thought when they've got a project. It's, well, let's talk to our contractor. You want to be their contractor. I often say that about uh, my car mechanic that I had for so many years. It took a long time to find this car mechanic. And when I finally found this uh, car mechanic, Vito, he's now retired. So, you know, I've been dealing with the dealer. Uh, but when I had uh, older vehicles, uh, Vito was the best. You know, I knew that I trusted Vito. And uh, when he would charge something, I would never argue with the price because he built up trust over a long period of time with me be more if my car is broken how do i get it to veto well in construction if you're not going to be the low cost provider you might want to think about um, that people value the service that you provide them you call them back right away they need to see you about something they've got some sort of emergency you're there front and center for a lot of businesses and a lot of people that trumps being the low cost provider by far uh, so uh, that's another whole way to develop a competitive advantage and position yourself um, that way. Uh, focus on narrow niche, doing a better job than rivals, serving unique needs of niche buyers. Well, again, there is so many niches in construction. Uh, I just uh, last uh, semester, I had my students doing research on um, different companies that they construction companies that they saw and I didn't even think about it, but um, uh, there's uh, construction companies that they specialize on building uh, funeral homes and crematoriums. That's what they do. Funeral homes and crematoriums, North America, boom. 
well, you know what? If I'm building a funeral home and crematorium, I have very specialized equipment and very specialized things. I don't want to just get a regular general contractor. There's a few, not a lot in that market, right? And so, you're, you know, you can get a certain premium with certain clients that have many of these uh, facilities. And so it can be uh, a really good niche. I never would have thought of that niche, but um, there are a lot of niches that you can just imagine in those particular um, areas. And if you become really good at that, it's hard to be good at everything, right? But if you're really good at that, that would give you a big competitive advantage in that sector. It's also a sector which is not gonna go away, right? So that's the other thing when you think about that. It's a sector that's um, not going to uh, disappear. Whereas if you've got, uh, if you've got uh, a really good sort of, that you can serve like department stores, well, <sighs> Department stores have been a more of a declining market than a growing market in the past few years. It's a little bit different segment. So you've got to be thinking about those things. What segment am I in? And how is this as an industry moving in the future? Is it declining or is it growing? So develop the expertise, resource strengths and capabilities that aren't easily imitated by rivals. You can sort of think about some examples on that and there's all you know even in the area of uh consulting uh you know training and development uh bim um specializations it could be bim specializations with um, um delay analysis and using programs like synchro to look at how things are constructed side by side and being able to offer services there can be all kinds of uh, niche markets that didn't even exist five five, eight years ago. So you got to really be sort of thinking about that. And if it's something that everybody knows, then it isn't going to likely be uh, a long term sort of competitive advantage. So what's the company's current position? You have to think about the external environment, all the things that go on in the external environment, societal, political, economic, regulatory, technological, overall opportunities and threats. Uh, we can think about SWOT analysis, which is what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats to our business? A lot of times too, um, when we can see that we have a um, weakness uh, and uh, or a threat, we can spin that around that we could also use that as an opportunity if we retool ourselves and make it part of our strategy. Or we may decide eh, this is this is not the sector we no longer want to be focused in on. Um, so and technological change can have those impacts. Uh, internal environment, knowledge and skill sets of the employees, strengths of the business and the weaknesses. So that's also what I was saying with the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and strengths. Threats. Well, opportunities and threats are coming from the external environment, strengths and weaknesses. That's from the internal environment that we deal with internally. A um, uh, number of years ago, this going uh, way back, but before there was a period where we didn't have uh, gas fireplaces in houses. Everybody had a wood burning fireplace. And of course, uh, with um, carbon uh, emissions and uh, not just that, it was like you had to have wood, cords of wood in your backyard. You bring the cords of wood inside, the bugs would run out, people wouldn't like that. And you had to put logs on the fire. Not that there's anything wrong with that, quote Seinfeld. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But uh, today people in, the, in urban centers and the city, nobody wants to be going getting wood and putting it on a fireplace. Nobody, right? 30 years ago, there were people. They wanted to do that. Today, people come home from work, they want to go click and they want to turn on the fireplace. Uh, probably you can get also a remote that works from your phone if you want to, to turn on the fireplace. Shut it off. I don't want to clean it up. I don't want bugs running around. So that's, that's all that you do and you get the ambiance of a fire. Well, you know what? There was a whole bunch of people in the city that built chimneys and fireplaces and they do all these brick fireplaces and they were really nice. Well, it, when the technology changed, and actually one of our clients was one of the first ones that uh, invented the technology, which was at the time a company called InstaFlame. 
Um, when the technology changed, if you were a, a bricklayer that specialized in fireplace, you better start thinking about your business. You're getting all these, because they used to charge a lot of money to build this massive chimney and put in a fireplace, a lot of money back then even. And uh, all of a sudden people could get a zero clearance box, get the pipe hooked up very quickly, direct vent out a wall, no chimney. Uh, that was very inexpensive comparatively. So if you were in that masonry business as a subcontractor, you better start thinking about, hmm, the technology's changed. Now, you could think, one, okay, so we're gonna hire a gas fitter and we're gonna start installing these fireplaces, right? So as our masonry side decreases, we can triple the growth with all these people because they're less expensive with the uh, gas fireplaces. That would be one choice you could decide. Two, you might decide, you know what? We like masonry work, that's our thing. Uh, we are uh, not gonna get into the gas business. That's not our thing. And you could say, you know what? This is the city of Toronto. Uh, we noticed that there are a lot of custom homes being built. We are gonna cater to these custom home builders and we're gonna grow on that market side. We'll keep the chimney fireplace and we'll, we know it's gonna get smaller and maybe go away completely or maybe there'll be the odd one. Maybe at a certain point we don't want to do it anymore. But in the meantime, we're going to grow and build our custom home masonry services. Or maybe it's not custom home. Maybe it's with renovation contractors that do additions. Whatever it is, you've got a strategy, right? So you've got to pick what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what's the threats. And there can also be opportunities. Like I said, oh, that threat could be an opportunity if we hire a gas fitter and we actually leverage that. So that's looking at things from a strategic perspective. And you, you know, whatever your expertise is, you can pinpoint those areas, do some background research and give it some thought. And that helps to set the direction what you want to take the business. So that's why we want, that's some of the reasons why we want to think about it. And that's why it's dynamic. It's not static. We have changes, you know, you might have decided something and all of a sudden, because of the change in the marketplace, it no longer works. You want to stop it. You don't want to keep beating a dead horse. That's what some companies do. We had this fireplace business. This was our strategy. We stick with it and you stick with it like all the buggy whip makers of uh, horse and carriages in the early 1900s, and you stick with it right into bankruptcy. Um, but you have to know maybe this is not working, we have to develop a new proactive strategy. Uh, it doesn't mean you give up too soon, you just gotta really, you gotta have a good feel, a good finger on the tension that is going on in your marketplace. And when it's done, you got to recognize it and you got to do some um, serious soul searching. If that's your business model, it's very difficult for people when they're so far down the path, right? Um, they forget about the opportunity cost of, of not switching, right? So um, there's always that opportunity cost of staying with something. There's a sunk cost uh, in some things that, but at a certain point it's sunk anyway. So you might as well just shift. Um, the, the marketplace. So change in strategy may be required as a result of moves that competitors make to give themselves a competitive advantage, changes in evolving customer preferences, wood, gas, customer preferences that they didn't even know they had until all of a sudden a new technology appears, shifting market conditions, crisis situations. Um, so when we think about uh, the business model, Business model, when you hear that, just think about how do I monetize? How do we monetize um, the business? Um, that's the business model. So it's, it's pointless to have a strategy without any idea how to monetize it. You know, that was in the beginning with companies like Facebook and Google. Everybody said they have no business model. They don't know how to monetize. Uh, they figured it out. <laughs> they figured it out, right? Uh, so they definitely um, developed uh, the, the model. Um, they might have developed certain technologies first to get them in a position so they could develop the model, but they definitely had a model in mind. And then they tweaked it and adjusted it, and then you have what you have today. And so you definitely want to have a method and a business um, model. 
of how to actually monetize that. That means if you're going to be the low price producer, you better figure out how to do things very, very inexpensively so you can cover your overhead and profit. If you don't have that figured out, then it makes no sense for you to try to compete in a market where you're not the low price producer. It's going to leave you in a very bad way, especially in construction. You won't have any projects or either that or you'll be lowballing them and you won't be able to execute to make a profit. So really, this is the competitive initiatives. That's the strategy and the business model concerns whether revenues and costs flowing from the strategy demonstrate the business can amplify prof profitably and viably. All right. So you want to review the model and choices of strategy. Um, and there's many strategies and variables that a business can choose from. Um, uh, you got to think of two probabilities, likelihood. You've got different choices, right? So you've got to figure out, well, what, what are the pluses and what are the minuses? You might have one strategy that is like fantastic, but if it fails, your business fails. So that might not be as good a strategy to do as strategy B, which um, if uh, the strategy fails, the business is okay. If the strategy succeeds, this would be very good for the business, but not as good as the first strategy. And the third strategy might be that um, it's, uh, if it succeeds, it's okay. Um, it's not much damage to the business. So you got to decide, well, do we go with A? Do we go with B? Do we go with C? And um, you evaluate it, right? Uh, so there's got to be a criteria. Uh, you know, this is almost like when we talk about uh, lean construction, we talk about choosing by advantages. And there's a methodology of choosing by advantages. You lay out the alternatives. Um, you use like an A3, which is 11 by 17, and you highlight the different options and you really sort of look at it and see if this fits well with the direction the business is going and what the advantages are. You weight the advantages and uh, then you make a choice and it's a it's a real process that helps in the decision making um, ability of a business to determine which makes the most sense for us in those cases it's called cba choosing by advantages you can look that one up a little bit uh, degree to which strategy is flexible and adaptable that's the other thing you know if it's if it's very sort of uh, fixated and it's not very uh, flexible and you're in a very rapidly changing environment that might not be the best choice in some areas of construction things aren't changing that rapidly so depending what it is it might be okay but generally you want to look at those things and make sure um, that they uh, make sense so it's kind of it's like good strategy plus the implementation or execution it kind of looks like divided just really mean implementation or execution equals success right so good strategy without this it's not going to equal success uh, bad strategy plus implementation, it's not going to equal success. You have to have that combination of things working well. So, so having a good strategy doesn't solve all your problems, but it definitely is taking you through or on the right path uh, that we talked about when you're trying to set that um, map and that direction of where you want to go. And nothing affects uh, a company's uh, success or failure um, more than its ability to really develop good goals and strategies that are well thought out, implement and monitor and adjust, respond. And you know what, this third one here is really vitally important. And the good thing is we're in the construction sector. We're used to this. We know how to do this. So it's no different for the business. The difference is though, we're used to working in the projects and we're not used to working on the business. So that is a distinct difference that we have to be cognizant of and make sure that we're doing that. And really making sure that these, this is getting back to our previous discussions, are done well, which will make it easier for us to be able to do this. So that's the interrelationship between them. Uh, and making sure that we are able to do that. And I've talked about good to great, and this is kind of an interesting strategy to think about. And it kind of goes counter to some of the things that I mentioned, but again, I'll bring it up again. Get the right people on the bus, uh, get them in the right seats, get the wrong people off the bus, and decide where to take the bus. And that's all too about developing strategy within your business, making sure you have 
the involvement of your key people that they are getting part of that and they're going to buy into that they're going to be energized by that and that's going to crank their flywheel that's going to help you to successfully implement um, the strategy so i'm tom stevenson wrapping up once again and hoping you have a wonderful day and you start looking at the way businesses are run differently and you start thinking about how these can be actually utilized it's not just a business you know how this works this can be for your sort of life goals as well so you can think about these things on a lot of different levels tom stevenson signing off see you next time bye for now